What's up, TikTokers? Um, thanks a lot for all your questions. Um, lots of really good ones in here. I'm, um, yeah, if I don't know anything about um, a subject, I'm probably not going to give you um, a good answer. Like if I had to Google it to figure out what it was, um, yeah, there's not much point in you just hearing my opinion on it. So um, I'll let you know if that's the case. Um, Viking, I've got heaps from you, man. I'll do yours at the end, I think. Um, so, all right, sweet. Let's get into it. So Swiss Evans, if you could time travel to any particular time, battle, place to see, experience what happened for historian reasons, um, what would have been where? So um, this is a really selfish one. It would be the Battle of Arausio um, in 100 and when was that? 108 uh, BC. Let me just double check the time. Um, this is purely for my own um, research. Um, so I argue... Um, that what happened at the Battle of Arausio was a different model than one we've currently kind of expected. I argue that there were actually two battles fought on that day on either side of the um, the Rhone. Um, so, but it's really contested because the, the ancient sources are pretty poor. Um, so I would really love to go back and see what happened and see if I'm right. Because, um, yeah, I basically argued that the Battle um, battle of Arausio, oh, sorry, it was 105, wasn't it? Um, yeah, was fought on either side of the Rhone and the two Roman camps were connected by a bridge, which is why the two Roman armies were destroyed there. Um, it was actually one of the most devastating defeats in, in Roman history. We don't we know very little about it. Um, the current idea is, what the ancient sources say is um, basically that the two Roman generals hated each other and um, you know, they wouldn't camp close to each other. And um, when the first camp got attacked, um, the second Roman general wouldn't um, wouldn't march to the other consul's aid, and I just think that's ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, my the my my theory for the battle is that really what the Romans were doing was trying to defend both sides of the river. Um, there was a river crossing there, and they'd fortified both sides, um, basically to um, be able to defend um, either passage because the Germans were moving um, south along the Rhone. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of um, probably the best place I'd want to go um, just to see whether I'm right or see whether I'm absolutely full of shit, <laughs> which might be possible. Um, all right, question two. Uh, who had the best army of all time? Probably, probably the Mongols, I'd say. Um, yeah, pro like in terms of just absolute dominance over, you know, all kinds of uh, enemies um, dealing with the Chinese, dealing with the Islamic powers, dealing with the um, you know the Central Europeans. Um, yeah, it's hard to go past the Mongols, man. They were really, really, really scary. Um, so, um, exhausted designer, oh, exhausted engineer. Sorry, I'm just like, I can't read anything. Um, what were some of the lim limitations of the Julius Caesar era Roman army? I would have to say cavalry, man. Um, that was probably the biggest. So. Um, Basically, the Roman military had kind of specialized in uh, in heavy infantry. It always was the Roman, um, you know, com area of competitive advantage. Um, so basically, you know, what was typical for Roman armies um, at about, um, you know, the during the first century um, was simply to raise um, citizen legions and then augment them with um, auxiliary troops. So basically, usually um, detachments from... Um, you know, local allies, um, you know, people they'd signed a treaty with. So, for example, Caesar relied heavily on Gallic cavalry because it was excellent. Um, and you see this in, in the early interactions with um, the Parthians, that they, yeah, the, the Romans really have trouble um, dealing with horse archers. Later on, um, you know, the, the Romans defeated the Parthians quite badly at a couple of battles um, about a century later. Uh, but I'd have to say that was the biggest single limitation. Um, light infantry as well, um, but this was less of an issue. Uh, I think really cavalry was the biggest one. But practically, anyway, you have to kind of look, um, you know, the whole military system was built around the utilization of um, of auxiliaries. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how fair that is. But um, I probably still have to come down on, um, on cavalry. Uh, do I know anything? Sorry, uh, Nate Day writes, do I know anything about the Spanish-American War? Not really, man. Um, pretty much just from what I've read or uh, listened to, um, Dan Carlin's podcast was really excellent. Um, I, I think a, a good way of understanding it is, um, you know, just to, and take this with a pinch of salt. Um, really, the United States, um, it was all about Cuba, I think, uh, essentially. 
um, you know, Cuba really dominates uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and especially then, uh, Mississippi River trade was extremely important to the United States. So um, they really did not want a foreign power uh, controlling Cuba. Uh, sorry, a potentially f- a hostile foreign power, like a great power. So, for example, if um, you know Germany was able to stage a fleet there, that would be uh, a huge threat to the United States. Which is kind of why the Cuban Missile Crisis happened as well. Um, you know, when thing when Castro took over, um, you know, the, the Cuba posed a real serious threat to the United States, not just with nuclear weapons, but by uh, being able to contest the Gulf of Mexico, which really is um, a really important near sea for the United States. So I think really most of it was about Cuba. Um, Yeah, otherwise it was probably just, you know, the United States is coming of age as a great power. Um, You know, everyone had seen how the United States' potential to be a great power, but really it was, um, you know, the Spanish-American War when everyone started to take the US seriously. Um, So I think it was, yeah... A little bit of that as well. But uh, um, yeah, I'll look, I'm not an expert on it. So, um, uh, Mad Piper 00 asks, um, have you seen the NFB documentary series of war commentary? I haven't, I haven't seen that series, man. Um, Matt Benjamin, could I give a rundown on the uh, history behind the current Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict? I don't actually know that much about it, to be honest, man. I don't know that much about um, you know, Caucasian history. Um, I know currently, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of foreign powers which are kind of involved, uh, which has always been the case for this part of the world. So, um, you know, the Turks and the Armenians obviously have a long and sordid history. Um, the Azerbaijanis and the Turks are actually basically allies from what I understand. Um, and yeah, the Russians have a military base in, um, in Armenia. So it's all, yeah, it's all a very complicated state of affairs. I think, um, there's an ethnic issue in the, what's it called? I don't even know how to say that. Nangrono something. I I don't know. Look, a lot of the Soviet republics, like a lot of, um, in, in the former Soviet Union, um, there's a lot of, territories that crystallized into nations that really have undisputed sorry unresolved um ethnic issues basically um this, you see the same thing in places like turkey with um uh, with the kurds so um yeah just be, where these borders land often don't reflect um ethnic realities so i think that could really be what's going on there um but yeah look i'm not an expert man so take that with a pinch of salt P51 Mustang versus Spitfire comparison would be cool. That was from uh, the Big Meech 21. So I think they're basically the same, man. They're very similar. Um, They have the same power plant. I think the whole point of the P51D was to um, essentially take a Spitfire or or an aircraft that had very similar performance characteristics um, and make it go all the way to um, uh, Berlin and back, basically. Um, The whole point was to give a Spitfire more legs. Um, You know, they're, they're powered by the same power plant. So they have very similar um, you know, kinematic performance. I think in terms of which one out turns, which I'm not sure. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if like, uh, you know, Spitfire Mark nine, um, would out turn a P51D, but they're, they're very similar as far as I know. Um, but yeah, I haven't looked up the stats or anything. That's just going off my memory. So, uh, okay, here we go. Ronnie Faringo, um, is the F-22 better than the SU-57 or the J-20? Um, I think, I think we, it'd be pretty safe to say, uh, yes, yes would be the answer to that. Um, so obviously we're speculating, we don't know, um, the actual capabilities of these platforms, but there's some things you can tell. So, um, you know, firstly, let's just look at the, the SU-57. Um, if you look at close up pictures of the SU-57, it's plan form alignment. Um, that means how all of its little edges are. Um, you know, designed to maximally uh, reflect radar away in the kind of uh, direction you want to really, really uh, reduce your radar cross section. Uh, its planform alignment is pretty bad, so it literally has panel gaps. Um, and that, if you compare that to like an F twenty two or an F thirty three, um, every single little edge on those things is perfectly manicured. Um, and so, I think it's very safe to assume that. Um, yeah, you're looking at probably an order of magnitude or more higher RCS radar cross section for the, um, the SU-57 compared to the F-22. Now in, in fifth generation fighters, that kind of, um, advantage in radar cross section is huge. Um, so I, I don't think the SU-57 is particularly stealthy. Um, 
you know, pretty much the same deal for the, for the J20. If you look at the canards on it, that it's not a really stealthy platform. Um, it's it's stealthier than like uh, you know an S um, an SU twenty seven uh, flanker, but it's yeah. I don't I don't really think the level of RCX reduction on either platform would compare to an F twenty two or an F thirty five. Additionally, um, you know the Russians. I think with the MiG um, thirty five, this is the first time they're actually going to field an AESA radar. So that's not a, an active electronically scanned array radar. Um, you know, the United States is basically on its uh, third generation of AESAs. So, the, you know, the idea that the, the, the sensors inside these platforms are going to be anything comparable to what the United States is putting out now, I think is just kind of silly. Um, you know, like the Russians even lack advanced manufacturing for things like gallium nitride, which um, transmit, receive modules, which is very important in advanced radars. Um, this is one of the reasons they've really been struggling to catch up to the Americans. Um, you know, in terms of radar production. So I really don't think they're going to be basically, they'll be much better than, you know, say the J-10 or, you know, any of the flanker variants. But um, yeah, I can't really see them being comparable to the F-22 or even the F-35, to be honest. In terms of their, like, kinematic performance, um, you know, their speed and maneuverability, I'm sure they'll be very excellent. Um, I mean, that's always been a Russian strength and, you know, the Chinese copy the Russians for a lot of stuff. Um, so I'm sure it'll move. Um, but in terms of it's, you know, what really makes a fifth generation aircraft important, you know, which is basically stealth sensors, um, you know, and stealthy communications, um, I think they're going to get outclassed, to be honest with you. Um, Jonas Blaine, top 10 generals or um, historical figures and why. I, this is a tough one. I'll probably just have to give you my favorites. Um and so there's not going to be any why for this. It's just going to be um, my top 10. So Julius Caesar, just because it's Julius Caesar. Uh, Scipio Africanus, because I think he was the best general the Romans ever produced. Um, Napoleon, because I'm in love with that level. That The whole Age of Sail is just amazing. And um, Napoleon really had some masterpieces, um, you know, places like Austerlitz. So that's that one, two, three. Um, who else? Um, these probably... Um, super interesting cat. Uh, who else? The Abraham Lincoln. Um, I don't know, man. I'm running out of paper. Maybe uh, the Roman general Sertorius. A uh, huge fan of his. Um, Alexander the Great. Um, uh, a Theban general called Epaminondas. Um, I don't know. Oh, Alcibiades. I'd love to hang out and have a beer with Alcibiades. That would be awesome. He's one of my favorite people in ancient history. Um, yeah, I don't know how many that is, but that's probably all I've got for you, dude. So Mad Hatter asks, could you comment on the, inf on the effectiveness of railway guns in the first world war? Uh, I actually don't think they were effective. I think they were a bit of a waste of time, to be honest. Um, I mean, I guess because the whole front was so static, the immobility of huge railway guns like that, um, you know, makes them less useless than they would be in any other conflict. Uh, I still don't think they were worth the, the investment involved in just making those goddamn things. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't think of any realistic use they have. Um, you know, super long range artillery. I know they were shelling Paris for a while, the Germans, with a railway gun. But, um, you know, what good does that do? The odd, lobbing the odd shell into Paris doesn't really win you the war. So, um, yeah, I think they were kind of a waste of time. But... Yeah, that's just my take. Um, could ask, do I know any historians like um, Jared Diamond with a more generalist approach? Uh, not really, man. Um, you know, most of um, the people who move in my circles are all super specialized. Uh, they're all ancient history dorks like me. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've read a bit of uh, Jared Diamond's work. I can't remember which book it was. Um, you know, probably about 10 years ago. And uh, it, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I don't know. I don't know how much I fully buy. Um, I don't know. Some of the conclusions he draws um but yeah look it's not something i've really looked into so all right big one jg levy writes who are the gauls and what wars do they fight with rome so um the gauls were basically celts so uh who were the celts the celts were a um a group of peoples who really emanated out of central europe in um the middle of the first millennium bc so um basically there were kind of marauding tribal groups 
um, that came out of the area around Switzerland and really um, conquered and settled all of uh, modern France, the United Kingdom, areas of um, Spain as well, um, you know, the central, um, what we call the Celtiberians in the central highlands, um, also um, down into um, Asia Minor as well. Um, they also, uh, a couple of tribes crossed the Alps and settled in the Po Valley, um, the Boy and the Senones. So um, the Gauls was basically just the Roman name for Celt. Um, so Celt is a Greek term, uh, you know, Gaul is a, is a Latin term. Um, but what we come to mean when we hear Gauls is um, the Celtic tribes who lived either in the Po Valley or lived in, um, in modern day France. That's what the Romans called Gaul, uh, the land of the Celts. So uh, the Romans fought numerous wars with the Gauls. Uh, the Gauls were a huge um, and persistent security threat to Rome. So um, very early in the piece, at the Battle, Battle of the Alia in uh, almost four, I think it was 393, you've got a memory, um, BC, uh, a Gallic tribe of the Senones defeated um, the Roman army, um, the one Roman, Roman army they had at the time at the Battle of the Alia, and then uh, took the city. Um, they basically burnt large chunks of Rome to the ground. Um, it was only like when Camillus intervened that um, they left. Um, but this wasn't the only war they fought. So um, there was constant instability on, on Rome's northern frontier once it had expanded up to the Apennines. One of the biggest um, wars actually happened between the two Punic Wars. Um, but as the Romans had really pushed their um, area of control further and further north, um, they began basically really coming into contact with the Gallic tribes of the Po Valley in northern Italy. In response to this, um, the uh, a tribal coalition of the Boi and in Serbs um, really got together and, and fielded a massive army, which they then invaded Etruria with. Yeah, the Romans and Etruscans fought a huge battle um, at Telamon. Um, and it was, yeah, a huge and bloody battle. We don't know how many people were killed, but lots. Um, they were only three days march from Rome on that occasion. That was, that was in the 220s, so before the Hannibalic War. Um, after that, so in the first century, or sorry, the second century, so the 100s, after um, you know the Hannibalic War, the Second Punic War, um, there are numerous smaller conflicts with individual Gallic tribes. Um, you know, even as late as in the 110s, um, I'm pretty sure one consul was ambushed by a Gallic tribe, I think the Allobroges. And um, the, the, his army was basically cut to pieces. Um, this is one of those really little known battles that happened um, before the consulships of Marius. The most famous Gallic war was um, Caesar's conquest of Gaul. So um, this essentially was a decade long campaign where Caesar was first drawn into Gaul in order to prevent um, basically marauding Celtic and then later German tribes from destabilizing Gaul and then to bring the whole of what we call Gaul into a Roman sphere of influence. Um, so this was really the last major um, engagement with the Gauls. And so this happened, you know, um, in the first century. So Roman had 300 years of conflict with uh, the Celtic peoples to their north. And um, yeah, it really wasn't until Caesar um, absorbed them into the Roman Empire that that threat ended. So, um, Sausage Man Forge asks, um, I'd love my take on the Battle of Long Tan. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say about the Battle of Long Tan. I mean, I think it was, um, it was the first time that um, the Australian task force was really challenged by the Viet Cong. Um, I think it was a tactical victory. I think what the Australians had done, um, which was quite smart, was basically create an area which they knew they could um, utilize artillery without any real worry of civilian casualties. They cleared out most of the, um, and they essentially resettled the local villages, which really allowed them to use combined arms in a way um, that the Vietnamese um, couldn't. Well, basically, well, of course the Vietnamese couldn't because they only had light infantry essentially. But um, I think, yeah, the ability to really utilize artillery and utilize it heavily um, is what saved the Australians at Long Tan. Um, you know, like it, the infantry performed well, of course, but they were, they were badly outnumbered. Now, um, basically a little bit of a pretty bad ambush. Um, I think it really was, you know, Australian combined arms warfare that really saved, um, you know, the Australians from disaster there. 
Um, but this is just Western um, doctrine in general. You know, you, you use you don't just use infantry. You use infantry and artillery always in combination. If you can, you use armor as well. If you can, you use air power as well. Um, it's about bringing all the arms to battle. And I think the Australian and New Zealand guns have a lot to um, be said for in that battle. Um, but yeah, I think it was an Australian victory. IG-223, what would happen if Operation Sea Lion had worked? Um, I think basically what would have happened is, um, I think the war would have ended. Um, I think the British would have sued for peace. And, um, you know, at that point, I don't know whether the Germans would have gone for regime change or, or what, but, um, you know, whether they would have installed a, a friendly government in the UK um, and left some naval units there or some, sorry, some army units there. Um, or would have gone for kind of like a Vichy France thing. I'm not sure. But at that point, it, de it, it depends. Like it, if the war is really ongoing in the UK, like just say the Germans take, um, you know, a little chunk of, um, you know, Southeastern England and are just stuck there for ages. And like, you know, maybe there's some space for the United States to intervene. But I think if it's over quickly and, um, you know, the uh, UK government basically sues for peace there and then, um, I think the war's over. I think the Germans just win and that's it. Um, you know, do they eventually take on the Soviets? Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, I think one of the main reasons um, Hitler did decide to invade the Soviet Union was because he, without uh, sufficient raw materials and also by having to keep a hundred division plus standing army in order to cover the soviets he really couldn't specialize in the kinds of production required to defeat um the british so um yeah i just think basically the germans win the war and um yeah that's a, a nasty outcome um luckily for all of us sea line was never going to work um all righty what else we got here um so swiss evans again why do you think the pacific war isn't as well covered in film media compared to the European theater. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons. Like, so um, I think the combat itself, um, you know, is just, it's hard for normal people to understand. Um, you can understand, you know, swashing tank battles and huge, you know, massive drives, things like D-Day, big attacks. Um, but yeah, the kind of grueling, awful battle that was um the pacific war whether it be you know the australians in new guinea f fighting in a place like gona where you just have to weasel out one little firing position after another and every single inch of ground you take is you know covered in your own blood um you know or the americans at iwo jima you know although that did get a movie but you know even like um tarawa or some of those tiny little islands they were hell holes and um, there really isn't a, a dashing story you can tell about it. Um, you know, the poor boys got landed on these tiny little beaches and they had to kill suicidal enemies one after the other and uh, they lost a horrible toll. It's just an awful story, you know. Um, most of the fighting in the Pacific was just awful. So basically, I, I think um, the kind of combat that you see in the European theatre is just easier for for people to wrap their heads around it's easier for people to understand it's easy to tell good guy bad guy stories um and I, I think yeah the the fighting in um in the pacific is just a colossal waste it's just a you know which is what warfare really is um but often people you know in, in media don't want to know that they don't want to know that really it's just about often um having a whole bunch of your guys die and having hopefully more of their guys die um often that's what a battle is but Anyway, um, Rich, Richard Hafner um, asks, am I Dan Cullen? No, I'm not Dan Cullen, but I love Dan Cullen. I love his stuff. He's a legend. Um, alrighty. So Swiss Evans, again, uh, did ancient Rome have special forces, elite regiments? If so, how do they differ from regular forces? Um, the thing is, when you talk about ancient Rome, the, there are so many different time periods where the army changes. So um, in the early period, which is kind of where I specialize in, which is the Republic, um, the mid-Republic, there were some elite units, kind of. So um, in every, so basically every time um, one of the Roman generals, a consul, would go to war, he would have a consular army. The consular army would have a bunch of Italian allies and um, a bunch of Roman citizens. Now the consul would pick out basically an elite force of the allies um, called the extra extra extraordinarii um which if any of you have played rome total war um 
you'll know that that's a unit. Um, so that was actually a real unit. I don't know how useful they actually were, though. I can't, you know, in all the battles I've read, I've never heard that, you know, um, these units were really effectively utilized. Um, you know, going through to the Empire, which I'm less familiar with because it's, yeah, it's not really my area that I specialize in, um, there definitely were elite uh, infantry units. So the obvious ones are the, you know, the Praetorian Guards. Um, so these men were... Um, specific elite infantry that were meant to guard the emperor they were elite i'm not sure how much better they would actually do on the battlefield um, compared to normal roman legionaries i think they were selected so um, you would hope they would have higher physical standards but in terms of their weapon proficiency and the rest i mean uh, look i don't know i, I would i'd probably rather take um you know some actual legions that were on the frontier fighting germans as opposed to the praetorians if you had to have uh, a one-on-one -on -one fight with, um, you know, just a couple of units. Um, so yeah, look, in general, um, special forces, they weren't really utilized um, in the way um, we utilize them now. At least, look, there might there, you, there may be um, occasional little anecdotes you can hear about that. Um, but yeah, not, not in any of the stuff I've read, not in any of the battles that I've studied. Um, you know, elite regiments really weren't how the Romans went about war. Um, they really went about mass production of high quality armies, not really small, um, highly trained units. Um, Chloe Smith, the Burma campaign. I don't know much about the Burma campaign, maybe because I'm an Australian and that means I spend all my time on the Pacific War. Um, yeah, really trying to read about um, basically what happened in New Guinea. Also, that's because that's where my grandfather fought. Um, yeah, I don't know all that much about it to be honest with you um i know it's a really really un under understood theater of war that doesn't get enough attention that's for sure all righty bush bush uh, a six nine eight asks why did the germans turn to the sea and not to paris after they broke through the ardennes um i think the whole plan was to isolate uh, one of the wings of the um, anglo-french army so um, <clears throat> they'd kind of marched on Paris in World War One, and it didn't really do too much. Um, you know, you might scare the French, but it's not going to necessarily put them in a situation where they've lost. Um, however, isolating one wing um, and forcing basically the British to retreat really did cut off most of the best French divisions in France. Um, you know, not only the, the British and BEF, but um, basically the highest quality divisions of the French army were with the BEF driving on Holland. Um, so all of those guys were cut off. Um, so I think it actually was a master stroke pushing through and, you know, severing them from the rest of the French army. Um, any thoughts on Stalin? Um, Stalin was a bastard, <laughs> you know, he's an evil prick. I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, pretty much. It, I mean, yeah, I, I can't, I can't say many, too many redeeming things about Stalin. Um, yeah, I don't think he's, his leadership in the war was particularly good. Um, yeah, he was just a, just an evil bastard. Um, alrighty so um, Patrick uh, go and ask for a breakdown of um, a Roman legion so um, obviously it depends on your um, on the time period you're talking about so but we'll start from the most famous area which was the like late Republic or mid Republic um, that's kind of the area I specialize in so um, there are two different kinds of legions at that point there's what we call a manipular legion and then there's a cohortal legion so a manipular legion is made up of maniples each one of these maniples is um, basically a grouping of two centuries the centuries were 80 men each that's where the word centurion comes from um, a centurion is the commander of a century so a maniple was like a, a, a junction it's like a company of these um, two little uh, centuries this was the main unit of the legion so um, the, the Manipular Legion would be broken down into three ranks, uh, each one of which was armed and equipped differently. So the front rank was called the Hastati. These were usually men in their 20s. Um, they were more lightly armored than the other ranks. They usually just wore a brass breastplate. They still had the, you know, the Spanish sword and um, the big scoot and the shield and the javelins though. Um, the guys behind them were uh, the Principes or those in the prime of life. These were guys in their 30s typically. So um, they were armed with a, a chainmail shirt, uh, a male shirt called a lorica, um, also with you know the Spanish sword, the big shield, and the javelins. Um, the third line, the guys at the back, were in their 40s. They were called the triarii. 
Um, and they would, instead of having, they would still have a Spanish sword, but they would also have like a long hoplite spear. They were kind of like hoplites, if you know what that is. Um, and so they would form the third line. And so each of these lines was broken up into maniples and it would um, basically form kind of a checkerboard. Um, so um, there'd be gaps between the maniples of each line and the line behind the gap, the front line would uh, cover the gaps in the front line with one of their maniples. So this formation was called the quincunx because it, it, um, if you look at a, a dice, you know, like a gaming die, and you look at number five, um, where you have two at the front, one in the middle, two at the back, that's what the formation looked like. Um, so this was this was a manipular legion. So there'd be um, 10 maniples of each um, division. And then also you'd have a large group of light infantry called velites. Um, so this was one legion. Um, so in the, the legion didn't fight alone. So in the Republic, um, sorry, the mid Republic, you would have um, what's called a consular army. So this was an army commanded by the consuls. So each one of those armies would be comprised of two of those legions, as I've just described, and then two legion equivalents of Italian allies called Arle or Wings. So it would essentially be four legions. And this is what would fight. This is the actual, you know, the fighting formation of, of the Roman army of the mid-Republic, the consular army. Um, so that would also have cavalry as well. Um, so how does that compare to modern uh, formations? So I guess um, the best way, you, you could kind of think of it like um, the legion was like a brigade and the consular army was like a division of multiple brigades. And the division is what actually fights. Um, the major difference between, say, a modern formation and a legion in function is um, the amount of support and administrative staff that go in a modern division. So modern formations actually have quite a small amount of just infantry, people who actually just shoot, um, because there's so much other stuff that needs to happen to allow modern warfare to happen. So um, think about huge numbers of like just logistics guys, guys who drive trucks, guys who, um, you know, artillery, anti-aircraft guns, or I'm thinking World War II here, um, you know, machine guns, um, administration um, staff, planning staff, um, <clears throat> sorry, hospital staff, um, all kinds of other ancillary um, elements that are added to the division. So the reality is, um, I think only about half of the men in a typical, say, 1942 British infantry division um, actually do any fighting. The other half are all supporting the guys at the front. So that's a huge difference between, say, a Roman legion, which really was all just fighting men, and, uh, and a modern formation. Um, but yeah, the best way to think of it is kind of, the consular army, which was a group of four divisions, um, four, sorry, four legions, um, really was the equivalent of a modern like division or corps. That's the fighting formation. Now, as you move on to later on periods, so, um, uh, you know, kind of the time of Caesar, um, the, the individual maniples, so this grouping of uh, the, the legion into maniples, it kind of dissolved. Uh, the maniples have been grouped into something called a cohort, which is more like a battalion. So um, originally a cohort was three maniples of um, was three maniples of heavy infantry put together. Um, later on, the maniples were just kind of broken up, and the men just you know were, was basically like six centuries. Um, and so at that point, a, a, um, a legion would not be made up of thirty maniples, but we would be made up of ten cohorts. And this is kind of the um, yeah the the structure that Caesar utilized. Um, but again, like the same thing basically applies. A typical Roman field army would probably be, you know, between four and six of these legions, about between 20 and 30,000 men. Um, so again, that's very similar to like a, a division or a core in a modern military. Um, alrighty. <clears throat> Is Justin Trude Trudeau's real father Fidel Castro? Maybe. Uh, I don't think Fidel was that good looking. Um... Mars224 writes, how different would the war be if Italy stayed neutral in World War II? Uh, I don't think that different, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I think the Mediterranean theatre was would be totally kind of taken out of play. Um, you know, you wouldn't have had a North Africa campaign. You wouldn't have obviously had the invasion of Italy. Um, it might have been a little shorter, um, makes me think. Yeah, the, um, um, the, the Allies would have really focused on, on Northern Europe. You might have had an invasion of, say, Norway instead. That maybe makes sense. The main, I think one of the main areas in which the, um, the Italian campaign and the Mediterranean in general really aided the Allies was it enabled them to really test their amphibious warfare capability, their amphibious warfare doctrine. Um, they really developed the skills um, and learnt the lessons that would be applied so well in D-Day in, in things like Operation Husky, Operation Torch. 
um, you know, even, you know, the Solano landings. Um, so they really got to like, especially the Americans, blood the Americans get, uh, like understand uh, American logistics and that kind of thing in a much less uh, critical theater. So then when the American armies were actually deployed to D-Day, that's why they performed so well. Um, you know, all, all the kinks had kind of been worked out in the in North African theater. So although it could have been quicker, it strangely could have gone worse for the Allies. Um, yeah, it's hard to tell. But yeah, I really think that the whole emphasis of the war would have shifted north. And yeah, you might have seen a campaign in Norway um, because I really think the British especially would have been reluctant to launch D-Day in like, you know, early 1943. I just, I don't think the Allies were really ready. So Mannerheim, um, Mannerheim is a legend. I mean, um, you know, the Finns in general um, performed extremely well in World War II. We all um, know how legendary, um, you know, the Finnish defense of Finland was. And Mannerheim really kept his, kept his stuff together. Um, you know, I think also it was very prudent of the Finnish leadership in the continuation war to really not press home, um, you know, their attacks on, say, Leningrad. Um, you know, Finland always maintained that really their only goals were to, um, you know, regain Finnish territory. And they had no interest in you know, defeating the Soviets or anything else. Um, I think this was actually, yeah, really prudent um, because you know, look, the Soviet, um, the Soviets treated the Finns quite well after World War Two, which is strange considering how poorly they treated, um, you know, the rest of Central Europe. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, I think Mannheim was a legend in terms of its wider impact on World War Two. I don't think it had that much impact. Um, you know, it was really quite local. Um, you know, had, had Finland stayed out of the war, I don't know how much it would have changed. Um, you know, I think the the disaster of the Finnish campaign in 1939, the Winter War, was um, it, at least, I, I think it did spur a lot of reforms in the Red Army that happened pretty quickly. But um, yeah, apart from that, I'm not sure how much impact it had outside um, the kind of local conflict. Andy Swain asks, how would I compare the Fabian strategy, strategy to the Russian strategy? Of trading land for time in World War Two, well, it was similar. It was similar. I, I suppose the real difference with the Fabian strategy wasn't just to um, to with, withdraw. It really wasn't to disengage from um, uh, from Hannibal. The whole point of the strategy was to maintain close contact. So, um, yeah, it was to follow. It was to just shadow Hannibal, shadow Hannibal closely, and really disrupt his foraging. Um, so, I, I guess you could argue that. Um, you know, by drawing um, the Germans deeper and deeper into um, into Russia, they were kind of fighting a logistical war in the same way that, um, you know, the further they penetrated, the harder it was going to be for the Germans to, you know, basically supply themselves. Um, but yeah, I don't think, I don't think the aim was, um, was the same. So I, so the Fabian strategy was never aimed at, at allowing the Romans to uh, build up a strong force to counterattack or um, it was literally just designed to just grind down Hannibal's army, just prevent them from doing any massive damage um, and prevent them from um, getting supplies. So it really was just trying to like basically starve them out um, was the idea. Um, and it was actually after Cannae, that's pretty much what the... Um, what most general, uh, Roman generals did when they engaged with Hannibal was stay close, but be careful. Um, yeah, the, the Soviets really were, they had no choice. They were getting annihilated. So they just had to like, yeah, run <laughs> pretty much uh, until they could get their crap together. Um, but I don't think, I don't think, um, you know, Fabius Maximus ever really wanted to, um, yeah, he didn't, he didn't, he never wanted to fight a battle with Hannibal. His whole point was to never fight a battle with Hannibal. Um, you know, it was to really just, grind down um yeah grind down the punic army by starvation essentially so it was like it was similar but not exactly the same the muffin mix asks um just tank and warfare um i don't think um you know advances in um anti-tank missiles are making tanks irrelevant so um i, I usually it's not um you know, like an advance in a, in a, in a weapon that makes um, tanks irrelevant, like makes a weapon system irrelevant. Like um, it's it's usually that that method of doing warfare is really no longer uh, useful. So the whole point of a tank is to have a mobile gun platform that is, you know, reasonably well armored. 
Um, I still think that has a, a, a really solid place in um, in modern warfare. Um, so until that metric changes, um, yeah, I still think you'll see tanks around. I mean, interestingly, some I think some Western militaries um, because they emphasize strategic mobility so much, like the ability to move uh, their um, their military forces large distances extremely quickly, you know, by things like air. Um, you know, so for example, I think um, the British are starting to think about not replacing the Challenger and that kind of thing. I don't necessarily think that's because tanks don't have a place. Um, it's just because they really emphasize strategic mobility. So um, yeah, every time there's an advance in um, anti-tank guided missiles, um, there's an advance in defensive systems. So now you have active measures, you have explosive reactive armor, um, you know, you could even see things like small point defense systems on tanks um, if it really came to that. It just really comes down to how useful is it to have a big, heavily armored mobile gun on the battlefield. I still think it is, so I still think you'll see tanks. Um, Proper Jim Lad asks, how far behind was Britain to making nuclear weapons? Well, I think it was only a few years. I think they were about, what, six years um, when they actually detonated their first nuke. I think it was 52 or something. The thing was, the British had helped the Americans quite a lot in the Manhattan Project. Um, you know, not massively, but they certainly had helped. And they expected, um, you know, some of the information in return. And the Americans just basically said, no way, we're not giving you anything on this. Um, so I think they were a little unhappy about that. But um, it didn't take them too long. Um, yeah, it was definitely within um, the UK's scientific capability to construct a weapon like that. So it was less than 10 years. Not the author asked, what's uh, my take on building of Hadrian's Wall? Um, yeah, I always, I always thought it was a bit strange. All of the frontier defenses were a bit strange. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how much utility they actually provided. Um, if you look at the amount of frontier they're talking about, so Hadrian Wall's easy because it's such a small little chunk of, of territory. Um, you know, you're not talking thousands of miles, but there were frontier fortifications all across the um, you know, the like along the Rhine and the Danube, well, these are huge areas. And, um, you know, the Roman military of the empire was, was actually relatively small compared to the amount of area it had to cover. So um, I, I think it was really to like, to control trade and interaction between the areas within and outside the empire, um, more than it was about any real um, military, either deterrent or, um, ability to stop foreign armies coming into um, coming into the empire. So, like, if a large group of, say, Franks um, really wanted to cross these defenses, they were going to be able to do it. Um, so, yeah, it was probably more about funneling things like trade into specific, um, you know, ports of entry, essentially. Um, but yeah, it was probably probably a waste of money. But I don't know. I haven't thought too deeply about it. King Dots asks, uh, when am I going to do a surfing TikTok? Do a surfing TikTok anytime you like, uh, depending on what you want to talk about. I can talk surfing all day. Uh, I love to surf. I do it every day. So also make my own boards. So Hubes, um, what does the Zomwalt class bring to the table? So um, I think the best way to think of the Zomwalt class, a lot of people are super critical of it because um, it's basically a failure but the um, best way to think of it is actually as a technology demonstrator. So this is very similar to the Seawolf class attack submarine. Um, so the main idea of the Zomwalt originally was, um, you know, with the, the large gun battleships being retired, that the US Marine Corps specifically needed some naval gunfire support. And so the whole idea was to build a destroyer, a set of destroyers, which would have an automatic 155 millimeter gun system, um, which would use, you know, special rocket assisted projectiles, it would have huge long range and all the rest of it. Um, so that's actually a reasonably simple thing to do. What the Zomwalt class did was try and basically uh, push the envelope as far as uh, naval technology goes in a whole bunch of areas. This is why it's really just a technology demonstrator. It's really not, um, you know, although it's, it's very expensive and the United States might not get that much utility out of the Zomwalts, um, they really are a huge leap forward in, in naval technology. And I think that's really... Um, what we should look at them as. Um, very much, uh, as I said before, like the Seawolf class attack submarine. Uh, hugely expensive, only make a couple of them, um, but really f um, to serve as the foundation for later um, ship design. So in terms of what the Zumwalt brings to the table, 
Um, it's actually the, one of the first, I think it's the first warship to um, have a substantially reduced um, radar cross-section. So this means, um, you know, things like maritime patrol aircraft will really struggle to detect it, um, you know, at, at the ranges they usually detect ships at. It makes it much more stealthy. Um, but also internally, there's a whole bunch of advances, um, you know, in, ter in terms of the computer system. Um, the, um, the electrical system is super advanced as well. It has huge amounts of electrical power. Um, and the way the electrical system inside the ship runs is very different as well. It has very low levels of manning compared to um, for its size. Um, the radar is um, an AESA which is an active electronically scanned array radar, which is very advanced. Um, so that, that kind of technology will now be used on the Flight 3 Arleigh Burks. Um, you know, the, the uh, vertical launch system was a totally new design. So really it was, um, Zomwalt was a way of really fleshing out some ideas um, in naval shipbuilding. So um, everyone's going to be super critical of the Zomwalt. Everyone will say it's a waste of money. And now, especially now because the... Um, the ammunition for the uh, 155 millimeter gun is has basically been cancelled. Um, the Zumwalt isn't even being used for its original goal, which was uh, naval gunfire support. So um, again, people are super critical of it as a ship. Um, you know, basically calling it a huge waste of money and, and failure. But um, I bet you it'll a lot of those systems, a lot of the advances of the Zumwalt will be the um, the foundation for. Um, you know, the next generation of warships when um, the United States Navy moves beyond the Burke. Um, the reason the USN is prioritizing Arleigh Burks at the moment is because they really need proven warships in large numbers right now um, to deal with the Chinese. So, and the Burke is perfectly fine. Uh, it's a great warship, especially good for dealing with um, essentially what the United States faces in the Western Pacific. So more Burks right now is probably... Um, worth more to the United States Navy than, you know, a few more Zomwalt-ish type destroyers. But I think the next generation of warship will look very much like a Zomwalt. The Wild Ginger, I love a ginger. I'm a ginger as well, mate. I, I know where you're coming from. Um, he asked, do uh, do I think do I think Thatcher was too brutal in the way she handled the Falklands? Well, no, I don't think so. I don't think she was too brutal. Um, I don't know. She was belligerent, but... Um, you know, if I was a UK citizen, and I know I, you know, given my own political views, I probably, um, you know, would have really wanted um, the UK to go back and um, take the Falklands, you know. Um, the Argentines basically invaded, um, you know, I don't know if you can really count, count the Falklands as a chunk of Britain, but it certainly was um, nominally British territory. So, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know specifically what you're referring to. Uh, maybe there's specific episodes in which you think she was quite brutal but um no i don't think so i don't think so um all righty louis asks what was the germans most decisive victory in world war ii absolutely no questions asked battle of france um that was one of the most brilliant victories in military history i think it should go down with you know austerlitz or Cannae or you know um whatever masterpiece you want to think of um it really was a brilliant brilliant um piece of generalship um well it wasn't just generalship it was a piece of planning um piece of operational maneuver let's put it that way um yeah the france everyone has this idea of france like they're just surrender monkeys the french in world war at the beginning of world war ii were the most formidable land power in europe they had a, a massively proud tradition the french army had performed very well in world war one the french were no joke and the idea that the germans could just basically wipe them out in a couple of weeks was amazing um it really was, yeah, it really was a masterpiece. Alrighty. User 383, I can't do all of your numbers, asks, most influential battle of World War II? Um, I would say the Battle of the Atlantic was. Um, I would say that pretty in terms of one specific battle, um, more rested on the Battle of the Atlantic being won. Um, than any other specific battle. So if you go to the if you go to the Eastern Front, um, you know individual battles tended to not matter so much, just given the scale of the place. Um, but yeah, the um, you know the Battle of the Atlantic, everything else, um, the whole Western Front reopening and um, maneuver warfare coming back to the, the plains of France, all rested on the ability of the United States to mobilize its manpower and its industrial capability and move that stuff to the United Kingdom. Um, that's why I think if you're going to look at one one battle, um, I think, yeah, the Battle of the Atlantic come, is pretty much the most influential. Um, you know, you could argue that the um, 
you know, some people might say the Battle of Britain, but I don't think the, um, the British were ever, ever even a possibility of losing the Battle of Britain. And even if they had of, um, Operation Sea Lion wouldn't have worked. So I actually think, yeah, um, yeah, I'd say uh, the Battle of the Atlantic. So Blaine asks, is the uh, Abrams tank outdated? No, I don't think it's outdated at all. Um, you know, I think we've come to a point with, um, you know, armor and tanks, much like we've come to with firearms. I mean, there isn't a huge, um, there are no large technological leaps really to be made um, at the minute. That's why we're kind of at a place of stasis. You know, if you look at the Russian tanks, they're the same tanks as they've been making for, you know, 50 years. The T-90s just... An evolution of the t72 you know like they're all they're all just the, the same kind of stuff why because we're kind of at a place where there isn't huge gains to be made um in tank design you know like the the, the gun's great uh the armor's pretty good you know um i don't i don't see what like what the next generation tank would really look like that would make an abrams look outdated i think an abrams is still an amazing amazing armored vehicle um you know, things like fire control and optics and that kind of thing make the Abrams a deadly fighting machine. I don't think it'll be outdated for a while. You know, like the, just to bring it back to firearms, like we're still using, you know, the M4, uh, the Americans are. I mean, a lot of Australian units use it too. Um, the Russians are still using AK variants, you know, which is like, how old's that? Um, you know, even the Australians, we use, um, you know, the Steyr, which looks, you know, we now have an updated version called the F90, but um, you know, that looks super futuristic. The style was invented in the seventies, you know, um, I think, and the reason these guns aren't outdated is just because we've come to a place where, you know, gun design is pretty perfected. Um, and I think we're at a similar place in tank design. The, the only thing is, uh, the Abrams, all these tanks, they're just really heavy, which means they're not very air mobile. So they don't have huge amounts of, um, s strategic mobility, you know, the ability to be moved quickly by aircraft and stuff. Uh, you can do it with an Abrams, but yeah, you get like one in a C-17 as opposed to like, you know, a whole company of infantry. So um, I think that's the only issue with the Abrams. Um, Max asked, did the sea people cause the downfall or was it the overall planning of the economy? Are, are you, I think you're referring to um, the Mycenaean collapse and um, I don't know, man. I don't, that's basically um, my, my expertise in ancient history kind of ends at archaic Greece. I don't really know anything before that. Um, I can't, I can't tell you too much if that's what you're referring to. Um, alrighty. So Viking, you got heaps of questions here, man. I'll, I'll, lots of great ones. I'll start from the top. Uh, most important, uh, war, Roman wars shaping history, I would have to say was the Hannibalic war, second Punic war. Um, that one really determined who was going to be, um, you know, the Mediterranean superpower, or at least who was going to dominate the Western Mediterranean before the second Punic war, there really were like five, uh, great powers in the Mediterranean. They were all pretty evenly matched. You know, you had, um, the Italian Confederacy led by the Romans, um, you know, which also had control of, um, you know, Sicily and, uh, Sardinia. Um, you had Carthage, which dominated the North, uh, the North African coast, but also had a large and wealthy empire in Spain. Um, you know, you had the, uh, Antigoned Macedonians, which, um, you know, in, in, Macedonia was a large and wealthy kingdom and, um, basically dominated all of, you know, normal Greece. Um, and you had, uh, the Seleucids and the, and the, um, Ptolemaic Egyptians, all of them were huge, powerful empires. Um, so really not, you, you, it would be hard to argue that one of those powers massively, um, eclipse the others in terms of, um, you know, geopolitical power after, uh, the Hannibalic war, Rome was, um, yeah, Rome was really unstoppable. Like Rome, the Roman military, uh, really had been finely honed into a, a really precise instrument. And, um, now the Romans had basically control of the super lucrative, um, Spanish empire, um, the Punic empire in Spain, um, you know, and Carth they had no Carthage to counterbalance, um, counterbalance Rome Carthage was now a tiny little rump state so um yeah I think that that had that war gone differently whole of history may have gone differently um once that war went Rome's way um yeah the, like the the eastern um you know the Diadochi the um, successor kingdoms really fell easily um so I think that is it's one of the most pivotal wars in history it's actually one of the most interesting as well um, I love the Hannibalic war so I think that's definitely the most important one 
Top five most iconic Roman battles. Ooh. Um, Cane. Um, Zama. Um, you know, it's hard to go past um, Hannibal versus Africanus. That's a, that's a huge one. Um, Pharsalus. So um, Pompey versus Caesar, another amazing one. Um, Alicia, just because of how cool all the Roman entrenchments were. Um, you know, the siege of Alicia. Um, yeah, like any time, you, if you Google that or look at any of the pictures, um, just the scale of the Roman engineering there was just awesome and amazing. And um, yeah, I think that's um, got to be up there. And then maybe um, Adrianople, um, when the Goths defeated um, the Eastern Emperor, I think. Um, yeah, that was a huge one as well. Um, but yeah, so many to choose from. Don't know what you mean by that one. Corruption of the Centurion or with the decline and fall of Rome. Um, I don't know whether that's typo, man. I'm not sure what you mean on that one. Um, what's Russia's grand strategy? I think um, ultimately Russia's grand strategy is to... Um, at stage one, Russia's grand strategy is to dominate the former Soviet Union. So um, Russia views the former Soviet Union as its sphere of influence. Um, I think in a larger kind of... Um, at a larger scale what the Russians want to do, they, they, they lack any natural borders when it comes to Europe. Um, so basically what they want to do is extend their area of control, um, you know, increase their strategic depth um, as far west as possible. So, um, you know, ideally, um, yeah, Russia would absorb, um, you know, things like Belarus and the Ukraine um, in order to put as much space between its vital centers and, you know, the industrial heartland of, um, of Europe. I think that's their ultimate kind of grand strategy. And if you look at things that way, um, it really explains why, um, you know, they they really want to dominate um, Ukraine and why they can't allow, you know, Ukraine to just be pro-Western and and um, they, they really see like a, a pro-Western Ukraine, let alone a Ukraine that's, say, integrated into NATO. That would be, for Russia, an existential threat um, <clears throat> because at that point they have potentially hot, hostile armies being staged you know, within very close uh, proximity to their vital areas. Um, so I think that's what explains Russian aggression in places like the Ukraine, um, which sucks because basically the Ukrainians just want to, you know, be a democracy like anyone else and have their own um, self-determination. But um, the Russians will never let that happen, or at least they will do everything they can to prevent that from happening. Um so when will Russia absorb the Nordics and the Baltics and should the US care? Um, so again, it's the same issue with the Baltics specifically. Um, you know, having potentially hostile powers, i.e. NATO, that close to St. Petersburg, um, you know, is very uncomfortable for Russian, uh, you know, national security elite. They don't like that at all. Um, you know, if there was to be, um, you know, it's hard to imagine now, but just imagine if, you know, there was a crazy change in, in politics and, um, you know, you had some far right wingers come into power in places like Germany again. Um, the idea that a hostile alliance could be um, staging forces in the Baltics is again, an existential threat to the Russians. And so there's, there's, that's why they want to absorb the Baltics again. I don't know about the Nordics. I don't know about the Nordics, but the Baltics, absolutely. Should the US care? I don't know. It really depends. Um, it depends on, you know, what the US wants to be. Um, if the US cares about, um, you know, the Western alliance in, in NATO, um, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, I think was, I can see the moral argument for absorbing the Baltics into NATO. Um, I can also see how long-term that is a huge area of um, instability. So, you know, the, the small Baltic states, they've been picked on by Russia for years. Uh, they need to be defended. Um, you know, uh, they want to be defended. They want to be part of NATO. That makes sense. Um, but it's also going to be a long-term area of instability because um, that's so threatening to the Russians. So in terms of why should the US care now, um, essentially because the US has, um, you know, committed to their defense. Um, you know, the US values its um its commitments and its treaty relationships um then yeah the u.s should care i think the u.s should care in general as well because um an aggressive rush or an aggressive authoritarian russia that starts destabilizing and then absorbing its neighbors um is really a threat to regional security and global security and i think it's against the u.s uh, it's against u.s interests u.s economic interests to um 
you know, allow that to happen. If the United States doesn't want to be a hegemonic power and really just wants to, um, you know, let the rest of the world deal with their own stuff, um, then the US doesn't have to care. Um, I think it is in the US interest to care though. Uh, the Comanches, I have zero idea about the Comanches, man. I, yeah, that's, I have no idea <laughs> about any of those questions. I'll have to skip them. Um, so will Australia and New Zealand be absorbed into China's sphere of influence? Uh, I really doubt that that will happen. I really doubt that that will happen. If you look at, um, so the Australian um, relationship with China lately has been extremely tense um, to the point where um, the Chinese have actually been a, launching a, a large scale cyber campaign to um, to attack Australia, essentially. Um, you know, Australia has a large um, a large scale uh, economic relationship with China, but that's starting to diversify. Um, and basically, I, I just think if you look at the whole region, um, I don't think anyone's really falling under China's sphere of influence. The, the utilization of um, soft power is um, is really bad. Everyone hates the Chinese. Everyone's scared of them. The Filipinos are scared of them. Uh, the Malaysians are scared of them. The um, you know the Indonesians are scared of them. No one's liking the way they're acting. The Vietnamese hate them. Um, you know they're basically they're they're, they're standing on everyone and. Um, I don't think anyone is, everyone's really looking for US and Western aid. Um, so even on, on a smaller scale, you know, um, Australia has a defense arrangement called the Five Powers Defense Arrangement with Malaysia and Singapore. And so Australia def- routinely now, quietly, but they still do it, um, routinely deploys um, ADF assets to, um, to Malaysia to um, <clears throat> do things like maritime patrol in the South China Sea, um, you know, so... I think everyone is really not falling into uh, China's sphere of influence. I think the way the Chinese have been acting, uh, the opposite is happening. Um, they're going to get more and more pushback, the more and more aggressive and assertive they are. Um, but in, in general, um, no, I think Australia and New Zealand, um, I think all of the democracies really are, uh, rather than being pulled into China's sphere of influence because of their economic growth, are really, um, you know, pulling together as a democratic alliance. I, I really see a counter block forming. Um, I don't think that'll be the case. So why did the Germans eventually destroy the Roman Empire in the West? So I think um, really this had to do with um, the crazy political instability that happened inside the Roman Empire. So um, by itself, uh, none of those German tribes really, you know, they, they weren't any different really to the same German tribes, the Macromani and whatever, who had been dealing with the Romans before. Um, so... Uh, really what had happened was um, Rome had been crippled by literally centuries of civil war. And, um, you know, like the legions that were defending the frontiers had time and time again been pulled away by some pretend emperor to go and fight some other pretend emperor to figure out who was going to be in charge. Um, You know, in the second century AD, this came to, you know, sorry, the third century AD, this came to such a a crescendo that um, it's hard to even know how many emperors there were that in that century um you know well over 100 it was crazy it was literally um the whole roman political system imploded on itself and this is why uh, this just caused so much internal instability that it just eroded roman strength from the inside um really when you know people like the vandals started moving across the borders there was no one there to stop them like it, it, yeah really it was political instability um that caused the Germans to really take over huge chunks of the West. Eventually, um, some of them were just, you know, granted areas of land within the empire and kind of made, you know, um, internal states within the empire. But that was that was never really going to work. Um, so I, I really think it was just it was just Western weakness, basically. Um, should the US defend Australia in a war with China? Um, well, I mean, Australia has uh, a def- basically a mutual defense treaty with the United States, so. Um, you know, I think um, Australia would defend uh, the United States. I would hope that the same would be true and the US would stand by its commitments. Um, however, it's impo- it's virtually impossible to see a war happening just between China and Australia. Um, you know, that's, yeah. Basically, you're looking at um, a war between the Western Democratic Alliance and China. Uh, you would definitely see Japan and, and Australia and the United States, um, I think, in that in that conflict you may see several other powers depending on how it went down um in terms of like whether the um united states should deploy assets to australia it depends i think the adf is capable of um dealing with a 
um, a portion of China's naval capability. Um, certainly not the whole thing. I think Australia offers some, um, you just geographically also offers um, the United States some um, basically, yeah, some very useful advantages. So staging air power, especially from Northern Australia, would really, yeah, would really be able to contest the South China Sea. So, and plus Australia has an integrated air defense system, has advanced bases, has its own capable air force. So I think that's kind of how it would go. Um, you know, in terms of if the United States basically wanted to step back from, from the Pacific, step, step back from um, the Western Pacific and say, you know what, we're no longer, um, you know, we're, we're no longer going to be involved anymore. We're abrogating all of our alliances. Um, you know, I think a lot of countries would just look to make different, um, different arrangements. I don't know what that would look like. I'm sure a lot of countries would come to some kind of accommodation with China. Um, you know, I could also see that, but you know, Australia has uh, security partnerships with a whole bunch of nations. Um, obviously, none of them compare to Australia's alliance with the United States. Um, but I'm just saying, in this crazy hypothetical that you know, Trump wins the next election and says we're out, we're not doing any alliances anymore. You know, uh, Philippines, Japan, South Korea, Australia get stuffed. Um, you could see an alliance between those countries, for example, and India, maybe. Um, you know, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, so what's China's grand strategy and doctrine in dealing with the U.S. military? Is it any good? So, um, the Chinese. Uh, grand strategy comes down to something called uh, the island chain strategy. So um, they basically made up these invisible lines called the first, second, and third island chain. So the first island chain runs um, from Japan through Taiwan, through the Philippines, down to uh, basically uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. Now, this is like China's near waters. So China's grand strategy is to dominate this area, basically to be... Um, you know, the undisputed largest power in this area and be able to do whatever they want um, within that, um, within those near seas. Um, the problem is, um, if you actually look at <clears throat> what's on that first island chain, you're looking at basically a, a bunch of US allies and US bases. So you've got Japan, which has a very large and capable military. You have, um, you know, American bases on places like Okinawa. Then you have, you have the Philippines, who, um, although they're, they're, they're a lot less capable at high-end war fighting. Um, obviously, you know, they have, um, I don't know if there's actually an alliance with the United States, but obviously pro-US and then down to Malaysia as well. Um, so this is all, and also you've got the Vietnamese in there who hate the Chinese, absolutely hate them. So, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of hostile powers, most of which are US allies and um, you have forward deployed US assets there. You know, in terms of um, their strategic aims it really would be to eject the united states from the first island chain i think that's their um their first real objective because from the first island chain um the united states and its allies can really cut off china from global trade and that is um that would be crippling to the chinese so um yeah dominating the south china sea dominating the first island chain is their first their first strategic objective. And then they, they've drawn other like magical lines through places like Guam, calling that the second island chain, and then all the way out to like, um, you know, Hawaii, which is the third island chain, which is all you know, fanciful stuff. In terms of their doctrine, they've created something called um, an anti-access area denial um, network or system. So what this basically is, is um, a large um, network of sensors which are designed to detect and um, track and classify shipping in basically the whole Western Pacific. And then that's teamed with very large stockpiles of land-based anti-ship missiles, either launched from um, aircraft or um, launched from um, land-based batteries. Now, everyone's um, so fascinated with the, um, the anti-ship ballistic missile, the DF-21D, I mean, the, I don't know how many of them they have. I don't know how well tested that technology is. It's really not about boutique little capabilities like that. It's just about heaps and heaps of like cruise missiles, like conventional old anti-ship missiles. Um, and the issue is China has built up large stockpiles of these things. So the whole point of China's um, doctrine is to basically prevent the, um, the United States from deploying carrier strike groups in the Western Pacific. And the way they're going to do this is um, by utilizing this, this large network of sensors, which includes like over the horizon radars and a whole uh, large satellite network um, to basically track where these uh, carrier strike groups are and then saturate them with anti-ship missiles. So it, and the, the issue for the Americans is, or for the allies, um, you can, 
um, defend one or two waves of um, large scale anti ship missile attacks. I mean, you've got very capable Aegis equipped um, defensive ships. The problem comes um, just from salvo exchanges because your missile stocks on board the ships will run low very quickly and they have heaps and heaps of anti ship missiles and warehouses. So even if you haven't sunk any ships, if your, um, your Ali Burks start running out of missiles, you have to turn around. And so therefore you you now can't project air power into places like Taiwan. So um, it's this anti-access area denial network that is um, China's main way of basically isolating the first island chain from the United States. So um, is this idea good? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's effective. Um, you know, I argued in a paper I wrote once that Australia should take on a very similar approach in how to defend ourselves from the Chinese. Um, Obviously, there are, there are numerous ways the United States is, is acting to counter this. Um, they've got a new doctrine, new doctrinal idea called um, distributed lethality, which is really to um, split up um, a lot of naval vessels into you know, you know, small or individual groups with the whole idea of complicating the, um, the, yeah, the, targeting, the whole targeting picture of, um, of the Chinese. So, um, yeah, that's my understanding of it anyway. Um, yeah, it's it's a real challenge. It is a serious challenge. Um, is the Th- uh, Thucydides trap real? Kind of. I mean, like it's it's maybe a little uh, oversimplified in in Thucydides, but basically, you know, the security dilemma is a real thing. Um, but it depends on how you look at it. You know, like if you are looking at it as, um, you know, wars becoming unnecessary, unnecessary wars being fought because you know people were were fearful of changing uh, powers. That's certainly a thing, but, um, you know, you also have to look at the nature of those powers and, um, you know, what, you know, how, how China conducts itself in the world and what a, a, um, what an international order dominated by China in, in our region, in the Western Pacific really looks like. And I don't think anyone likes that. I don't think anyone likes that idea. It's not as simple as just allowing the Chinese to rise. Um, if that were just a normal, nice democratic power that played by the rules and really had no intentions of you know challenging anyone else's sovereignty or anything like that i don't think anyone would care all that much you know especially in australia we've made a lot of money off selling stuff to china um but that's not who they are you know um so yeah i i I don't know i don't think containing them necessarily is is just the facilities trap um i think it's a little more complicated united states marine corps camp blitz i have no idea what that is man Sorry. Um, when will the Iranian government collapse? I don't know if they will, or at least anytime soon. Um, that's the thing about these authoritarian regimes. They they do tend to persist. I mean, how long have we all been waiting for the North Koreans to implode? You know, we've been like, North Korea is the most basket case country that's like ever existed in the modern world. A joke of a country. And it's still there. It's still freaking there. People have been talking for 30 years about how um you know how it'll when will it end so um the iranians man i don't i don't know i mean i'd love to see you know a liberal democratic um you know or just a a a more moderate government um come into power there but you know i don't know same with saudi arabia you know maybe with the saudis um like the iranians at least have I think a better argument for um, government regime legitimacy. I think the the Saudis, um, you know, the Saudis having a having a, a royal family uh, without any real religious, um, you know, um, justification for their being a royal family is a crazy anachronism in twenty twenty. Um, but you know, like I said, like they've they've. A lot of these authoritarian regimes, they just keep on keeping on. Um, so, uh, like, I, I think there's a good chance that in 50 years they're both still there. Um, I mean, who knows? But, yeah, I, I don't know. Man, I'm just happy I live in the West. So, um, how much of a paper tiger is China really? Well, I think there's two answers to this. So, firstly, um, I'm personally, although there's no answer, to, like, there's no objective answer to this, I'm personally super skeptical about China's... Um, you know, China's long-term economic prospects. So if you look at um, what's driven Chinese growth, Chinese economic growth since um, basically the global financial crisis, it has been um, investment in things like roads and the housing, um, 
the real estate market, um, basically driven by government sponsored lending. So um, this is not a sustainable way to grow your economy. It never has been. Basically, you just build up huge amounts of debt and you um, end up building huge amounts of infrastructure that don't give you any return. So obviously, people talk about the go cities. Um, you know, and I've heard people talk. Um, so for anyone who's not, who doesn't know what I'm talking about, the go cities are, um, you know, chi- the Chinese have been building cities with like literally hundreds of apartment blocks with no one living in them. People don't live in them for 10 years. They're just these empty cities. And um, the whole point is to maintain economic growth by investing, keeping, like, so keeping these workers occupied, um, you know, keeping these businesses um, humming along, building things, um, basically only funded by debt, which is directed by state-owned banks. Um, so all of this is really not looking good for long-term return. Um, so sometimes later on, you know, in 10 years, maybe um, a lot of these places are filled, but that's that's 10 years when there was no return on that investment. Um, yeah, it's, this is just not how things are done in, um, you know, open, normal economies. And um, people say, well, maybe the Chinese just do it, do it different. Yeah, maybe that's true. Or maybe they're just, you know, cheating, trying to keep everything ticking along and all those, um, you know, all those chickens are going to come home to roost one day. Um, so I actually think the whole model isn't only unsustainable, it's actually quite dangerous for China's um, internal economic stability, simply because of how much debt is accrued by doing that and how little return they will get on it. Like in the Western world, if, you know, in the United States or, you know, in Europe or Australia, if you build a road network, you instantly have people driving on it and you instantly have people paying tolls and that's how people make money in china it doesn't work like that the road stays empty for years and you know no one sees any return off it and the whole point is just to keep people in jobs so um i think the days of double digit chinese economic growth are probably over in terms of uh china's military capability so i think um I think the, Ch- the Chinese, um, you know, their aspirations for, for real blue water Navy stuff. Um, I think at the moment, yeah, it's, pr- it's pretty, um, it's pretty paper tigerish. Um, you know, we're looking at maybe four carriers. Those carriers are not that capable. We're looking at basically like Kuznetsov class ish carriers. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's better than nothing, that's for sure. Um, you know, they're looking at some, they're building some amphibious warfare vessels as well. They do have a large number of um, of modern-ish um, destroyers, and uh, the submarine fleet is really starting to modernise as well. Um, so they're not, they're not, a, they're not a total paper tiger. Uh, especially, I, th- I think um, close to within that first island chain, um, they're much more than a, than a paper tiger. They're um, yeah, they're, they're pretty dangerous uh, close t- to their own borders. I think their ability to project power um, is still pretty limited. Um, you know, yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think in a long-term conflict with, um, with the West, they wouldn't fare too well. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. We'll see. I, I certainly don't think... People... Are, projecting that China will become the largest, most dominant economy in the world and it will outclip. I just, I really think that's unlikely, personally. Um, you know, people were saying the same things about Japan in the 80s. Um, I don't know. There's just, there's so many internal uh, problems that China has to deal with. So, yeah, uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, all right, I think that's it. Where are we? Almost like two hours. Um, so thanks everyone for your questions. Um, I'll do another one of these at some other times. Um, if I didn't answer your question too well, it's probably because, yeah, I don't know anything about it. So, um, yeah, thanks a lot for your time and I'll see you guys on TikTok.